Well, welcome back, everyone, to day number three, and I uh, want to welcome the panelists. So we have uh, a group of panelists here who are all, can we call you as a group micro-mobility providers or, or shared mobility providers? I know Brompton, are you working on the, but no need to divulge culture corporate secrets here, but it, are you also working on like a subscription service at all? We have a hire and a subscription service. We have a hundred hire locations ah. in the country and we also run a sub-service as well. Okay, I thought I, I, I now live in Germany, so I'm not quite up to date we on that. We also have it in Germany. Oh. Ah. Wonderful. Bahn, Deutsche Bahn, so I'm going to see the name on our subscription service. It's a good, good partnership. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. George Liu, and I'm a researcher at the Technical University of Munich, and I also um, I run a, a firm called City UX, where I focus on how to make cities more livable, and, uh, and I do the audiovisual for, for this event as well. So a few hats today, um, and uh, my focus and my research is on the 15-minute city. So I got in contact with some organizers here, and we thought it'd be a, a nice match to kind of blend the two and uh, also hear about what micromobility kind of fits into these types of neighborhoods. So I recently did a podcast where I brought together um, a few actors in, in, in Belgium and, and the Netherlands uh, uh, about how, what are the challenges for micromobility providers to cities and how are consultants dealing with it. So I feel like this would be kind of a, a, a similar vibe, but exclusively from the provider's perspective. So I'm very looking forward to it. Um, and I'm hoping to also do this panel in like a, like a free podcast form. And we have the cameras rolling so we can uh, post it later for the internet to see. Everyone's good? Okay, so um, that's enough about me. Let's go with a round of introductions. Uh, let's start from, because of your wonderful titanium bike there. Uh, <laughs> tell us about your role at Brompton. Hi, I'm Julian. Um, I have a couple of roles at Brompton, but they all encapsulate one thing, which is um, focusing on mode shift. Or, um, because Brompton, we're rather simple people. We talk about bums on bikes, getting more people into uh, alternatives to the single occupancy privately owned car. Um, my journey actually started out in Amsterdam, so it's quite hmm. nice to have someone from the city of Amsterdam here today. I spent 10 years working, nothing to do with mobility, uh, actually doing business turnarounds in Amsterdam. And I tried to drive a car around Amsterdam because I am that stupid. Um, and after a year of that, I discovered the bicycle and it changed my whole kind of attitude towards cycling. Uh, so when I came back to the UK, I kind of got into mobility. I started off at Nextbike, for those that know it, that then became Tier, and I think it's Nextbike again now. I always get confused. Um, but then moved into Brompton, and um, I look after the Brompton Hire Scheme. As I mentioned to George, we have about 100 locations, and it's higher rather than share, so it's by the day rather than by the minute. So we sit alongside the likes of Lime rather than in competition to the likes of Lime. Um, but we also have a subscription service, mm -hmm. um, and critically, I'd probably work on policy and external affairs as well. So our whole focus is about getting that modal shift, getting people to try it. And I spend probably about two thirds of my time working with property developers because it's a very important area for property developers at the moment to look about how to get more sustainable transport onto their new developments. That's us. Cool. We go from uh, bicycles to scooters, but also bikes, right? Line. Uh, I, well, in London, bikes, but also scooters. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name's Hal Stevenson. I'm Lime's Director of Policy uh, for UK and Ireland. My role and the role of my team is to work with local, authority, local authorities to design, set up and run uh, well-used and well-managed shared e-bike and e-scooter services. We have a very large service here in London. We've delivered 11.5 million um, bike trips so far during commuting hours only this year. Um, and then we also have services across the UK in places like Greater Manchester, Milton Keynes, um, and recently Nottingham and Oxford as well. And uh, we go to car share. Yep, uh, so I'm Eleanor Kunz. I'm the CEO of Hayakar. So we are not a micro mobility provider, I would say. We yeah, are yeah. definitely a shared mobility provider and hopefully a supporter of micro mobility because our aim is to help people live without a car and just have a car when they need one. Hopefully use bikes and shared bikes, etc. as a result. Um, we are the only company that does peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, have our own car club. We also work for property developers, and we also provide a pool car sharing for local or, uh, authorities like councils, NHS trusts, universities, 
So we're really like covering as much as we can in terms of power sharing. Um, but we're definitely a very small organization still, uh, and we're only based in the UK. So. Cool. And uh, it, Eleanor, is that, yeah. may I say? Ele Eleanor, also, I caught you bring in, sneaking in a trumpet today. Yeah. So I, the group knows I play the trombone, so was, I feel like it's a bit of a missed opportunity. We could have done a, a, a brass duet <laughs> or, or a battle up here. <laughs> the stage is set. OK, so um, in the spirit, how do we describe ourselves then, now that there's car share? Let's just call it shared mobility, right? Yeah. That's, that would be a, a all encapsulating. All right, I'm just going to move this in front of you briefly so the camera gets this. And then I'll come out of the way. Uh, already no. there on the film. All we had to say, had to say was turn your face away. You didn't have to so there you go for the camera. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's have, a, let's have a brief vote. And basically, I'm going to go. So we're going to go from the most uh, popular topic here, uh, which I believe is geographic restrictions, right? So first question to all of you is, uh, Shofit, are all your vehicles GPS enabled? Yes. Does that no. help any much? Yes. No. no. Oh, yeah. Deliberately no. not. Interesting. No. OK. Why deliberately? Why no. deliberately not? <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of reasons. That's three reasons. Um, the, the first one, actually, is trying to hide a GPS-enabled device on the Brompton mm. is rather tricky. I don't know if you noticed, they're not the biggest bikes in the world. Mm. Um, they're not electric in our hire fleet. Second reason, we, we work with a lot of corporates, mm -hmm. and even though under GDPR you can clearly separate customer data from GPS data, a lot of corporates, especially banks, get very, very nervous about the concept of their staff being tracked. And wow. so by removing the GPS, it makes corporates a lot more comfortable. Mm. Third reason is cost. Oh. By not having it there, we save the cost in terms of the, the operational cost. Okay. And if I was going to put fourth one, a lot of people take our hire bikes abroad. Ah, yeah, five pounds a day, it's yeah. the cheapest way to take a hire bike. So, so I'm going to go back work there. to the original, who posed this question? Geographic restrictions. Yeah, could you pose the, the full question to the panel this uh, time? Yeah, I meant more um, where you'd operate. Mm. Is there areas like take London? So it's also a bit about the market, right? The market, so in this case, it's vandalism and theft. And yeah, so it's sort of where would you operate, I guess, commercially, okay. is it viable? To answer that question, maybe we can go around the panel and just state your current market uh, geographic operations, and then we can get into why you, uh, or what future plans for expansions, or, or what, what are the main restrictions that... Let's go from here. Where are you current? Yeah, of course. So London one's about, is one of our largest services globally. We're in about 16 or 17 boroughs, and we'd like to expand that um, to over 20 in the next 12 months or so. Um, so we're mostly in London, but we um, work with property developers outside of London as well. So if there is, for example, a development in Bournemouth and they have an S106 uh, obligation, we'll put a car there as well. So. That's how we expand out of London at the moment. Um, and we're national, so our most northerly ones, Stornoway, most southerly is Jersey, up to Carmarthen in the west. And in London, we've probably got higher locations if most, if not all, boroughs at the moment. Hmm. Okay. So let's now tackle the question of expansion. We heard quite a bit about the Santander bikes and their logistical reasons for not being able to expand to certain neighborhoods. Maybe that could be a factor, or it could be uh, politics or, or other factors. So who would like to tackle that question? What are the restrictions to further geographic expansion? I, I can't say on bikes, but with regards to car clubs, each borough has their own car club policy. So I know that with bikes, there was a, at least some form of agreement with some of the southern boroughs, I think, where they did the trial, at least, with a never-ending trial. <laughs> Uh, but with, um, with car clubs, yeah, it's just every borough will have a different policy, a different 
framework, a different length, some of them are multi-operators, some of them allow flex, some of them don't. <laughs> and basically you start over every time that you want to expand and then you borrow. Um, so that is the main barrier, to be honest. Uh, so for example, there is in Hackney, we want to be there, but we can't because there's a five year um, tender that's still ongoing and although it's definitely not fit for purpose with the current market conditions they can't change it so we can't come in uh, but we are allowed to be part of a pilot with like 10 cars so there's like ways around it but it's, it's tricky yeah okay so, so that's the big, would you say uh, political would be the yeah I would say it's like fragmentation and of the, the way London is built with all these boroughs is quite difficult compared to other big cities in Europe um, and then also political will. There are boroughs still to this day that will say car clubs uh, are not useful. Um, I, can, <laughs> I can name a few actually. <laughs> and in West London specifically, yeah. we've got a few people <laughs> that do not believe in car clubs um, and that it takes away parking from residents. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, comments from either of you? Can we go for this? Yeah, yeah I, think, I mean, when you look at what we're uh, trying to achieve in London, or globally is to take people out of cars for unnecessary trips. We know that in central London, there are fewer people using cars as a mode of transport anyway. So we're focused on making sure our service can reach areas where car use is more dominant and needs to be tackled. Um, in terms of the barriers to doing that, I mean, like I said, we operate in 16 or 17 boroughs, so we do cover a very large area of London. Um, one of the really special things about London in terms of um, Demographics and city layout is that there are, there's a real mixture um, of communities and we can make sure that our bikes can serve everyone because we're able to offer them across the, all of those boroughs. Um, but expanding further, the main barrier really is uh, infrastructure, which is a practical problem and a political problem. So we need the space to put the bikes in and we also need um, more riding space. So segregated cycle lanes, low traffic neighbourhoods. These are practical things that need to be fixed but they also require uh, political buy-in um, and political pressure to get done. Uh, infrastructure, would you classify that as a political? Uh, it requires political will. Okay, let's, yeah. how about your political will? Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah. What, yeah, it requires part. political will. I mean, for Brompton, we're somewhat different because we use um, our bike lockers. Um, they're very high security. Um, Touch wood. I say this, um, we haven't had a, a bike stolen by brute force for six years now out of our lockers, which is very unusual. We have a lot of lockers damaged, people trying to get them out, but they generally only try once, which means we can go into areas other solutions can't always flourish. Um, the other reason we can work in certain areas that other people can't is our operating cost is, is very, very low. Um, over 80% of our journeys are A to A because they're multi-day higher quite often. People are starting and ending their journey at King's Cross Station or at, in Stornoway, funnily enough, there's only one dock on that island, so, you know, they're going to have to start and finish in the same location. So our operating costs are very low, which means we can focus on purpose rather than profit. So we, our purpose is mode shift, which means we're not geographically restricted. We also don't require a kind of critical mass. Again, coming from a, um, a bike share world, I understand that you need a certain criticality in terms of mm -hmm. volume of bikes in order for a scheme to really take off. If people have to wander miles and miles and miles to get a bike, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you need that critical mass, whereas we can start with a single location, buy a new property development or buy a rail station, and we know that the operations will be sufficiently high to keep it going. So, you know, the two things, and this isn't we're clever, we've learned the hard way, we've been doing it for 14 years, trust me, we lost a lot of Bromptons building a dock that stopped people. Titanium Brompton? Oh, heck no. Um, <laughs> people would be turning up with forklift trucks at that point, oh, losing a whole yeah. dock. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of hard, hard lessons. Uh, who had the question on scaling? I did. Could you pose your question again? Yes. Um, what are the main challenges for scaling your business? Ah. Any takers? I can start. I can start. We're self-funded. Our main barrier to growth is the Brompton we self-fund. We've never gone out and sought external money. Um, that, to be, for the benefit of the tape, we do look to local authorities or property developers to, to pump behind the capital funding of our locations. But that means we're limited in terms of new locations by how many people we can persuade to fund them. So we typically launch 
10 to 15 new locations a year in the UK. But, you know, it, it slowly, slowly. On the upside, it means because we've had a very constrained growth, we've managed to uh, only lose Brompton main brand, the bank of mum and dad, a small amount of money each year. And they offset that against the fact that we're creating this modal shift, this positive ecosystem. So our constraint is we self-fund. Yeah, you as the audience have the right to uh, follow up with any questions uh, as they come up. So feel free to do that as well. Um, so we're on the topic of scaling and uh, the constraints or enablers of that. Is there anything from the car share side? Huge capital, right? So much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like sometimes it's like everything's against the car, the car sharing industry. So we've got, as I've already mentioned, the fragmentation and the borrows. Operational costs are vary as well. So parking permits will be a uh, thousand two hundred in one borough and then a hundred in the other. So it's just really does, and it's not uh, whether or not they're central boroughs. It will literally be the next door borough. <laughs> so you're on that line, and one side is the same people basically live there, but you'll have to pay ten times more to operate. Um, so there's this. Um, there's um, a lot of. Um, the unit economics are really hard at the moment. Cars are really expensive. There's a massive push for car clubs to electrify, which furthermore, it becomes harder and harder because EVs are much more expensive. And the really big struggle that a lot of companies have at the moment is uh, insurance. So a lot of community car clubs are flocking to hire a car to get on our own insurance, which we struggled to get in the first place. There was a time where we had to stop operating because we didn't have insurance in our past, so it's super tricky. Not a lot of providers want to ensure what we do, and it's really expensive, um, which again, with the EVs, they're high insurance group vehicles, in terms that makes either the car club operators make less margin because they have to adjust their price, or the consumer ends up paying more, which then in turn is, you know, with car clubs, it is really difficult for someone to see if they have to pay, let's say, 150 to book a car for a weekend, and then they think, well, hold on, like I could get a car for 9,000 uh, pounds on, you know, Auto Trader or whatever. So they start thinking like this, and then they forget that okay, it's just not 9,000 pounds. The car depreciates. You've got insurance. You've got petrol. You've got all of these things to add up. But because the higher cost is high, really high in London, um, we have. I think a lot more uh, barriers to scaling from a um, psychological standpoint from the users. It's not like hiring a bike for five pounds a day, like we're talking big amounts, you know. Behavior change. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is hard. And then a city like London that is sadly still really built for cars, it is quite difficult to get that mindset to, to change, really. Would you like to add, to, you don't have to have something, but if you would Yeah, like no, to I add. can. Um, I think we would look at two main barriers, one internal, one external. Um, the external one is infrastructure again. That's mm -hmm. essentially going to be all my answers. <laughs> <laughs> infrastructure. Um, look, Lime has obviously scaled very quickly over the last couple of years in London. Um, if you live here, you'll, you'll, see, you'll have seen that growth play out. Uh, like I said, we've done 11.5 million trips so far this year, purely during commuting hours, in the first three years of our service. So from January um, 2020 to March 2023, we did 12 million trips total. So we matched that only in commuting hours in the first half of, of this year. Um, the barriers, so external is we need, you know, as you're saying, cars still have too much of a dominant role in London and in cities across the world. We need more space for our bikes um, and we need even more progress on riding infrastructure. A lot of boroughs and TfL have done really good work, but there's still more progress to be made as we work towards Vision Zero. The internal barrier for us is actually managing that demand. In order to get more space, we need to, and when we talk about you know, what we say to city stakeholders, we need to demonstrate to them that we can be trusted to manage it safely and responsibly. Because if we can't make sure that we're managing our service in line with their um, requests and their requirements, then they're not gonna give us the additional space we need to continue the growth that we're seeing here. Excellent. So we've gone through, yes, a follow-up? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, as in uh, I learned yesterday, uh, today's point, that in the center of London, the car ownership is only 27% of households. So there should be a sea of opportunities, you guys, especially for car sharing, uh, because many of those people do have a need to go out. Uh, Countryside with family uh, or go to whatever vacation or something like that. Yeah. There should be enough 
enough uh, business for Asia in, in that uh, arena? I, I agree. For example, in Hackney, it's 65% of households do not own a car, yet it's one of the most expensive boroughs to operate in terms of car clubs. And they've made a commitment to refuse any new petrol car clubs <laughs> to come in the borough when they don't have the charging infrastructure for shared EVs at the moment. They are building such bays, but that's 15 bays for the size of... Like, Hackney is... I'm from Montreal, it's pretty much the whole of Montreal fits in Hackney in my head. Like that is how big that borough is. I'm exaggerating, but, <laughs> but it is really dense and there's a lot of people that don't own a car and yet things are just not um, stacking up in a way. We wish we could expand, we've tried our best as possible, but we are faced with such high operational costs that at, at the end of the day, if we're a private company, and if we're not going to make money, we're not going to go there, even if there's an opportunity and people do need car clubs. But you're not paying that money. I am, as a user. Oh, yeah, we are paying a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> We've got no, 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 high no, no, operational costs. You're not paying more money than you are getting from the user, otherwise you go out of business. I mean, yeah, it's, but it's, so, so, um, so it's a matter of how you price your, your uh, car rentals. So the, the, problem, the problem is, if, of course, if your frame condition are so exorbitant that it's impossible that is you are being worked against. That's of course another thing. Do I have a passion question? Uh, yes, and, and please phrase uh, in, in the form of questions. Important, if important point to bring us to the headline topic of this operational mm -hmm. capacity mm -hmm. uh, Yes, on the top line side, and again we're going to go into finance in much more detail, on the top line side it's pricing is a, a big lever. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at the operational Yeah. I, I just wanted to kind of pick up on it. I work, we work, because Brompton is very multimodal, because it turns out we, we work with a lot of different transport operators. And there's this head versus heart thing about behaviour change. If you speak to local and national government, they understand that behaviour change costs money. They get that. Mm -hmm. The head gets that. The heart, though, sits there and goes, shared mobility is a revenue opportunity for a local authority. Yeah. And those two things do not square up. And whether it's, whether it's car club or other modes of shared mobility, they will quite often see it as a revenue driver and then sit there and say, we're not generating modal shift, but at the same time, we're also not running, running money over there. The reality is, if you have to put your prices up so high that people aren't using it, you can't operate. It becomes an, a negative cycle. Yeah, or it doesn't, the shift doesn't occur. Yeah. If, as I said, like if you have to pay 150, 200 pounds, et cetera, on a weekend or even just a day out, there was a point where we had to rise our prices where for some people it resulted, it was 150 a day, fuel not included, to rent a car. Dig into that a little bit between why the operational bottom line that caused that push that we had to increase. The so, bottom line costs well, as I said, everything's going up. So we basically, there was a time where we tried to uh, essentially subsidize uh, the pricing to ensure growth and a behavior shift. Um, but obviously that was not sustainable. When I, I took the lead, I looked at closer at some of the unit economics and uh, we were in Islington, for example, where we were paying about 1,200 a, a pounds for permits. We had 50 cars, which was the minimum we were allowed to, uh, we were forced to have, which was way too much for us as a small company. We had 400 cars, 50 of them were in Islington, which is massive, <laughs> but we were not allowed to have less. So we had to buy all these permits. And I was like, no, we can't carry on. So we left. <laughs> it was our best uh, borrow in terms of business, in terms of usage, in terms of revenue. But in terms of margins, it was absolutely, like it was gonna kill the business. So we left for a year. And eventually, after a year, when we managed to pay our bill off by working in other boroughs, they, I asked them if we could come back, but under better conditions. And they um, half, well, even more than half. So the pricing of permits went down to 300 per cars, which is, you know, much more, affordable but what I had to do was basically show them in Walton Forest this is how much we're paying and you know there's 
we could do so much better in Islington because it, it's you've got all these low traffic neighborhoods you're trying to do all these things you're trying to get people out of their cars yet you've got a small player from London that's trying to help you make that shift but you're you're pushing us away because we can't operate and eventually they also remove that minimum of 50 cars and now we're just growing at the rate that we can afford to grow so we've had we started with 10 cars again so because we lost so many customers by doing that one year break sadly now we're at 25 cars so it's you know going back up but we it's it's just hard for a small business to be like told okay you have to do all these things you have to put all these cars you've got all these costs yet your demand grows at a certain rate, you can't just come into a bar and suddenly everyone drops everything they're doing and they're like, yes, let's go, I'm getting into a car club. Like, but it's, it's not the reality, it takes time. Um, we need support, but it's, yeah, <laughs> that's how we got to that place in London, really. So in a moment, we're going to come to a regularly scheduled commercial break. Uh, you have a <laughs> lovely presentation yeah. prepared for us, so maybe you can get into it yeah. a bit more in your presentation. But first, I want to take a... I've been waiting very patiently. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, I didn't ask a question a bit around scaling in uh, Dog Free and bit maybe touch on the partnership stuff with local authorities or public mm -hmm. organizations. Or, um, but I was wondering mainly what Lyman's um, long-term experiences with um, like rail providers or the underground here <laughs> it's the natural, like we talked about the Milton Road, natural partnership, but, and maybe it's a bit about that heart and head that they want to do these things, but then someone comes on the organisation and says, oh, but the locker in the station's a terrorist threat or something. Um, I just wondered what, yeah, you know, talk about scaling, it's kind of ideal what you want, or... Have you been that. listening to our phone calls? Um, <laughs> so, ah, well, yeah, you know very well then. So, so nine out of ten Brompton journeys are combined with another mode of transport, and I believe Lyme have a very high percentage uh, multimodality as well. So, for us, that that kind of inter interface between mass transit and um, and uh, micro mobility is is absolutely vital. And there's all kinds of data. We go to places like Cologne, for example, when they made the uh, bike share scheme free to use if you were a, a, a season ticket holder for the rail, they saw a double digit increase in the number of rail users. So it shows that if you really bring those two things together, it can have a very positive spiral. Um, about two thirds of our higher locations are adjacent to, to, to rail stations. I would say less than 10% of those are on network rail land. Um, network rail is a Fascinating. Is there anyone from Network Rail to the, here today before I say anything else? <laughs> because it is the, what I would be saying is get your house in order. Um, every time you talk to anyone at Network Rail, it's like the first time they've ever heard of a bicycle, never mind Brompton. And the fact that we've got 15 dots on Network Rail land seems just bizarre to them. So we actually, we generally work with property developers who have land adjacent or local authorities who have land adjacent and put them as close to the station as possible without physically on them. We've actually got permission in principle to put a Brompton dock inside Greenford Station, which is where the factory is, and actually at Liverpool Street Station as well, even though it's in a red zone. And that's been given by, um, um, by the relevant authorities. However, then trying to negotiate through the Byzantine network rail permissions process is, well, we've been talking about it for three years, to put it in perspective. So... I hope that sort of answers your question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what, so I'll say it's the obvious link, though. So, it if there's plans to have like a across the network, so well, we, we play monopoly with we play monopoly with Lo with London rail stations. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't got w Waterloo yet, which really upsets me because that's uh, that's my rail station in. So I get really upset every time I come out. There isn't a bike car locker, but yeah, absolutely. It's it, we strategically are trying to place next to rail station both both uh, central city, but also for us commuter zones as well, because a lot mm -hmm. of people pick one of our bikes up, bring it in on the train and then use it for their, for their day in London, rather than starting when they get into London. It's one of the reasons why our, our, our service is pre-bookable, so there's no FOMO. We don't have 20,000 bikes in London, what is it at the moment? That many bikes, <laughs> many, many, many lots of bikes. We have probably a thousand bikes in London, so we make sure that there's no FOMO that you, you pre-book and then you know there's a bike waiting for you when you get there. It's that different model. All right. When we come back, we're going to be covering 
removing barriers to the customer. But first, gentlemen, I invite you to take a seat on either side, and the stage is yours. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I sit yes. I'll sit in the corner. That would make a first time. Yes, sorry, I've got a bit of a Ah, you're the one who has to, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. I was, uh, I, all right, I thought you had to stay and run the presentation, okay, good, good, all right, so, uh, so let's do then uh, removing barriers to the customer, um, and who posed the original question for that? Yeah. Uh, yes. So, so what kind of barriers to the, the customer? Is it, yes. yeah, is there uh, something specific? Well, I like, know from research that uh, some people find it difficult to use the app. In Holland, not everybody owns a credit card, so the payment option uh, is uh, a barrier. Uh, but I'm curious to know what providers themselves know about it. Okay, how? So any challenges when it comes to like the, <laughs> Um, the customer access, for example, the apps. Do you see any challenges? People, uh, most people have a smartphone, but yeah, anything sure. there, yeah. And, and you're from the city of Amsterdam, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can talk about some of the challenges we've overcome in London, and maybe some of my personal experience of trying to use hire bikes in Amsterdam as well. <laughs> um, so look, if you're going to create a successful shared micro mobility service, it needs to be reliable and convenient. So when Julian's talking about the ability to pre-book. Brompton hire bikes. I don't, how, how far in advance can you pre book them? 24 hours. 24 hours, exactly. So we have obviously a much larger fleet in London. We still have a pre book option, but it's for 10 minutes. The reason it's so short is because we've ensured a good availability of bikes across the city. So you know when you're coming out of your house, you know when you're coming out of a train or a tube station, you're going to be within a, you know, a two or three minute walk um, of a bike and you're able to get where you need to go using it. Um, when you get to that bike, it needs to be fully charged, it needs to be um, available to hire and ready to work. Um, otherwise, people aren't going to use it for these time-sensitive journeys like commuting, which are their most frequent journeys, and the ones that we need powering our business um, all year round. If you, if you build a service that is reliant on tourists, it's not going to work. If you build a service that's reliant only on students, it's not going to work. You need a broad range of users, and that means creating that convenient, accessible service. And you also need people to the actual service design, you need people to be able to cycle where they want to go. It can't just be in one area of the city. Mm -hmm. um, how that compares, and Amsterdam is obviously, you know, the archetypal cycling city, um, but my experience of being there, is, for short periods of time, so conferences or weekends, etc., it can be very difficult to hire a bike for a short period. Um, so I've used Donkey Republic when I'm there, and I didn't actually know at the time but you hire the bike, but you have to use that same vehicle. Obviously, my background is, is short-term hires, so I like, oh, I'll buy a 24-hour pass, and that will give me access to individual um, bikes as I need them over that period. And I was left with a, I cycled the donkey bike all the way into town, and I was staying the other side of the river and didn't realize that I had to take it back that night to be able to use it. Um, so I found with that that there needs, unless you're staying, because you can rent bikes from the hotel, but again, it's per day, and you've got to, take it with you everywhere. The, the, the main barrier for me as a consumer, as opposed to you know, my um, <coughs> business experience, was just not having that short-term hire available where you can pick up and drop off. Because everything else is there, the infrastructure, the parking, but it's just the model uh, doesn't seem to exist uh, there yet. Do you find that like outside of London, reception becomes an issue? Because I've not used Lime Bike, but in Bournemouth, I tried to use another bike share, mm -hmm. and it, it was like, the most frustrating experience because like, it couldn't load, like it was just like on and off. And, and I've heard that currently in London, there's like some worries about the quality of the reception mm -hmm. and that it's also affecting people we, that use line bikes. I don't know if it's- We've, put some hub, we've actually put some uh, 4G hubs in the top of our docks to address, so if someone's bike yeah. on our docks, they can actually get signal. Um, the, the payment one's a really interesting one, and it's one that we're very conscious of. We do a lot of work on um, low propensity to cycle groups, um, which is typically uh, in the UK low income. It's counterintuitive compared to the, the Netherlands. 
uh, cycling still seen as a middle class uh, rich person's thing rather than a very affordable accessible mode of transport so ironically people in low income households don't see cycling for them it's completely back to France the most affordable way for them to get around London um, so we work a lot with low income households who don't have credit cards who don't have bank accounts we work with the Newham Refugee Project for example where they, you know, they have nothing beyond four walls um, so we do a number of initiatives one of them is very direct but very niche which is Wheels for Heroes which is where we physically provide bikes to these communities but for the obviously we can't reach everyone like that so for our, our main hire scheme what we do is we run a customer service that actually has people at the other end of the phone or on live chat and if people don't have a smartphone if people don't have a bank account they if people don't have any of this access they can actually call through and we actually have a program where people from those households can register and use the bike for free uh, we need to have a kind of a sponsor for them but about five percent of our, our ridership on the hire scheme are from people who would be not your classic um, hire users because they're better users in it. Mm. But it, it's there's no there's no magic wand. There isn't a magic wand for this one, uh, Georgia. Unfortunately, the the solution is blood, sweat, and tears. And you know we have a team who do nothing but work on that. Question for Hal. Perfect. Um, you didn't mention uh, maybe it's not a challenge for you, but app abandonment for your users, mm. you know, getting started as a first time user in the app. Do you see that as an issue? And if yes, how do you work with that challenge uh, to increase uh, maximum ridership? So in terms of people starting the sign up process to the app and yeah. then not using the service. Yeah, it's an interesting question because Lime is a point of use product, right? People don't sit on the sofa at home and go, oh, I'm going to download Lime and set myself up. They're doing it on the street corner next to the vehicle they need to get on in the next two minutes to get where they need to get to mm -hmm. on time. Um, so we try and make that process as frictionless as possible, but also making sure that we get the necessary details so that um, you know, we can avoid any issues with payment fraud, we can avoid issues with if someone leaves a bike where they shouldn't or behaves on a bike in a way they shouldn't, that we know who they are and we have their details um, and can come back to them onto it. And then also there's particularly for the scooters, there are regulatory requirements around things like driving license scans that we have to fulfill. Um, so split internally and externally. Internally, it's about frictionless as possible, uh, but get the details we need to be a responsible operator and, and take action as needed. And then externally, it's working with policymakers at a local and national level to make sure that what is required is enforced, but we're not going over the top, because again, we have to balance this out um, in terms of what are we actually trying to achieve by these services, getting more people on bikes, and that means making it more convenient to use the bike, but also to sign up to the app in the first place. So do you see it as an issue with the abandonment fees? Um, no, I mean, we, have, we obviously track data on um, completed sign-ups, converted sign-ups to first trips, <coughs> first trips to frequent riders, um, and generally where we have a smoother, um, uh, less uh, frictious user experience, uh, we see better better data there, so that's that's our aim. Whilst obviously bearing in mind our responsibilities. Yeah, we we did a initiative a couple of years ago. We saw that our, our abandonment had gone mm -hmm. really bad, got higher and higher and higher. And what happened was, um, because a Brompton is worth eight hundred and fifty pounds of anyone's money on eBay tomorrow, uh, we were getting people um, theft through fraud, um, they were signing up with with fraudulent details and then just not giving the bike back. <laughs> Simple way to steal a bike. Um, so we, what happened is we'd iterated increasing number of uh, processes to, re to remove the risk, but the problem was it had tipped so far over the other way that you know it was, it was easier to go and have an appointment with the king than that become a Brompton <laughs> hire member. So we then did a program where we went through and, and reanalyzed every step, and credit where credit's due, looked at people like Lyme and looked at their sign-up process and looked at where they were, were minimizing the friction in their process. And we went from, I'll share the figures, I don't think they're particularly coming through. We had about a 35% completion rate. We're now up to around about 80% to, to first time. So it was a massive change, but it was iterative, definitely iterative. All right. So, Hal, you get the final words before the presentation, but after we'll come back, the three of us, to wrap up. And my final question for you. Mm -hmm. It's 9.56. Perfect. You have four minutes. And we're good. What is the low-hanging fruit that you would tackle given your position at Lime right now. So given your expertise, 
what is a blind spot and a low-hanging fruit? Either it could be from a government perspective, mm -hmm. it can be from an infrastructure perspective, like what would make the most bang for society, given your expertise? Yeah, of course. I think, I mean, Lime has been really successful in London. We've been able to grow very quickly over the last couple of years. We're delivering a lot of cycle journeys per day. A good percentage of total cycle journeys in London are completed um, using Lime. Um, our responsibility now is to manage that demand more effectively, right? Um, my counterparts engage with cities all over the world. Some of those leaders in those cities are not naturally pro-cycling, and they have to make arguments as to why cycling is good. That is not the position we're in in London, thankfully. You know, City Hall, the mayor, Will Norman are inherently pro-cycling. They welcome the benefits of our service. Um, but they've made clear, and we can see it ourselves on street, that we need to make improvements as to how we run it um, to make sure that we're not taking that support for granted and we manage our business and the demand uh, that is driving it in a responsible way. So that's what we're doing at the moment. We're going um, to look at those operational changes we can make and come back with some solutions so that we can continue to grow, but without undermining people's perceptions of cycling or the benefits it creates for cities. It's very on point, Hal. And uh, as we near 10, uh, let's give Hal a round of applause. So the rest will be back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just thought I'd give you maybe a brief history and a bit of a summary of like how car sharing is doing in London so you can have an idea of whether or not it's doing well and if you are lucky to live in a different country. <laughs> um, with regards to what you brought up earlier about um, how we should just charge the price that makes us profitable, just want to give an example of you know, th these are all the companies that have tried and failed, sadly, in the last few years in London. Uh, some of them were peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platforms. Others were pure car clubs. There's big companies, Ubico, DriveNow, you know, th these are companies that are doing really well outside of <laughs> London. Uh, and yet, you know, they're not, it's not working here. So, um, for example, Getaround is a company that received 300 billion in investment and they still can't make it work in London. Um, here are the last ones standing. <laughs> uh, that's very few companies. Only two of these are only car clubs, so Enterprise Car Club and Zipcar. And credit where credit's due, they've been working really hard and managing to survive in a really tough environment. But I also have to mention that these two companies are backed by gigantic global <laughs> rental companies. Um, Enterprise obviously is Enterprise and Zipcar is Avis. So it's not, you know, um, it's a bit easier when you've got deeper pockets to survive in a really harsh environment. Churro is another example, just like Get Around, they received 300 billion in investment. Uh, so also a bit easier to survive in an environment like London where you can subsidize your insurance, for example, which is probably something that they have done at some point, like we have ourselves. Uh, and then Hayakar is a local small company that received, uh, I think, about 12 million in investment, uh, so n not much. Um, what is preventing car sharing from actually thriving? Because I think it's quite obvious it is not thriving in London. Even though you can see lots of zip cars everywhere, it's not a good environment. As I said um, earlier, Fragmentation, there are 32 boroughs in London. That means 32 car club frameworks. That means 32 parking policies, 32 pricing, 32 this, 32 that. Um, it's just endless. Uh, and obviously 32 political visions. So you'll have a mayor that is pro car sharing, but then someone in the parking team won't be. So it's just, yeah, difficult. Um, some real examples. Uh, I've named and shamed before. I'm, I'm not uh, scared of doing it again. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, Islington was one of those boroughs that was on the other side of the, the graph. So they were charging four times more than they are right now. But it took us leaving for a year and you know, losing many customers on our end. So that wasn't easy. Same thing with Tower Hamlets. We fortunately didn't have to leave. They accepted to reduce their price. Uh, so we stayed, but we managed to get there. 
these are the two only boroughs where we didn't have to push. It's <laughs> Greenwich and Waltham Forest. They came to us with affordable pricing. What I mean by affordable is, is quite easy. It's that it's not so much different than what a resident would pay for their own private car. This is where it really hurts. Hackney, Wandsworth, Kensington and Chelsea, they charge about four to 10 times more for a car club permit uh, than what a resident would pay. So if I own a vehicle and I can actually put it on a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform, mm -hmm. I would pay much less than a company that comes with a car club vehicle that will be shared by at least 20 people, if not more. So do you see the, the problem here, the big disparity? I will quote someone from Southwark Council that I met in another of these talks where they said, uh, point blank, so they did a tender for car clubs and we refused to apply because the price was exorbitant. And when I uh, challenged them in person about this, they said that they went on the um, car sharing association website and saw that a car club vehicle takes 20 cars off the road. You've heard that before. And they said, well, if it takes 20 cars off the road, we've got to make that revenue back. <laughs> so, so we're going to charge more. And that's how they went for their logic. So we were like, OK, let's 10 seems like an, uh, an OK in between. So we're going to charge 10 times more than a resident would because we're losing all these permits. That is the logic that went into creating a framework that probably took about a year and a half to draft and resulted in only one company going ahead with it, Zipcar to their own words because they had no choice because they had so many cars already in the borough. So it wasn't even because they wanted to and it made sense financially. It was just because they were stuck. Not great. <laughs> that is really, really bad. Um, as I mentioned, so unsuitable tenders. Uh, we've had another tender come recently from Haringey where instead of charging high on parking costs, they created a new cost, monitoring costs. <laughs> so, they would monitor whether or not we're doing well, but charge us for that. So in the end, the parking was about 400, but if you added all the costs, it went even higher. So it went to 1,300 for a car. Uh, so again, this time, no one applied. All companies decided to not go ahead, and they came back to us trying to figure out what happened. Um, they, there's many tenders where we have minimum volumes that are imposed, uh, as well as growth rates. Haringey is another example. The, the first tender they went ahead with was that uh, we had to come in and put 80 cars in one year or something like that, and then we had to double our growth every year, which was totally unsuitable for a small company like Hirecar, but also for other businesses. Enterprise Car Club has never grown with 80 cars in one go. Even in the cities where they have um, like the full exclusivity, it was more gradual. So that's really hard. Um, mandatory electrification rates, as I said, that is really hard for car clubs. The margins are very different. Uh, sometimes we have those obligations, but we don't have the infrastructure in place. So that means even more costs. Um, we've got imposed locations. So we get, so we get some tenders where all the locations have been chosen for us. That again, I understand from a borough's perspective that they have a lot of residential data, but for, from an operator's perspective, especially a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform, we have all that demand data. We know where people are looking for cars, and we can also pick locations that would work better for us. Uh, and the last one is having a single operator with a really long duration. So as I men mentioned, um, I think Edinburgh is one of those examples where they had a framework of uh, five years and one operator. And right now they're trying to get more people to come in, but no one wants to because we're all kind of reluctant to come in and have maybe 10 cars there, but you've got this big player that's gobbled up the whole market and has all the best locations already. So how do you go about with, when you have a situation like that? Um, so again, unsuitable. Um, which is really a shame because if you have more players, especially small innovative players come in, uh, that just means it's actually much better for competition. You get better quality, better pricing, you get innovation in terms of apps, etc. So it is <laughs> like playing against itself in a way. Um, I've mentioned this briefly earlier, 
Car insurance in the UK is totally different than in the rest of Europe. Uh, unfortunately, you need to insure um, the car as well as the driver. So each policy is per driver and it just kind of adds up, up and up and up and up. So the costs of insuring a car club vehicle are higher than in the rest of Europe at the very least, and Canada as well as another example. Uh, I won't go into too much depth for that, but it is a really sticking sore point for everyone, uh, not just peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platforms, but every car club is struggling. Community car clubs cannot get insurance at the moment. Mm. Um, fortunately, there's a commission that just started or will start um, with the new government where at least they're going to look into why the premiums have gone up so much in the last few years. For hire car, our cost of insurance has gone up by 30% since last year. So that is massive. It's more than inflation, so you know there's a problem. And we have a really good insurance um, ratio, so we don't have many claims. We're really good on security, so it's not about that. Um, what could help? <laughs> Property developers, it's definitely a massive um, plus, I would say. In the UK, there's something called uh, Section 106. Uh, I think it's Section 75 in Scotland. What it does, it basically imposes, in a way, on the new property development to um, put some funding towards a, a car sharing initiative, a car club, etc., or other modes of transport. So it's not just car clubs. Um, in some cases, it is just about getting subscriptions for residents. In other cases, which we really like, is when it goes as far as saying you've got to put one car, two cars, they need to be electric, you need to build the chargers. It's a big cost for property developers, but the way I see it, and I'm sure a lot of people here will see it as well, if, if you build massive new residential developments, what you're doing is, yes, you're creating housing, but you're bringing all these external, uh, external issues of traffic, congestion, often the roads are not uh, suited for that. So you need to have these things in place. And this is really good because um, oftentimes there's no obligations to use the car club that's already in the borough. You can use any private company because it's a private uh, relationship. It supports the car club for multiple years. The first few years of putting a shared vehicle is, are the hardest because you have to build that demand, but you've got all these fixed costs. So, and they're really high. Um, not joking, like the insurance, the car, the everything is really, really hefty. So having that support and that funding is a game changer. Um, and one big thing that I think is really good <laughs> is that when you put the sections in place, it actually incentivizes the property developer to rethink, well, do I need all these parking spaces in my development or could I have less? That means maybe more rental units more council tax for the council because there's more people living there. Uh, but in general, it's, you know, we need housing in the UK, so why are we building parking spaces when we could do something else? Um, as I said, it does favor the emergence of new players because it is a private business relationship. Uh, it doesn't have to be imposed by the council necessarily. Um, another big thing that councils do not know about so much is um, the grey miles, I don't know if you've ever heard that term. So um, in the UK it's called like that, I'm not sure if it's the same uh, in Europe. Essentially uh, a lot of public uh, organisations, staff will use their own private vehicle and then claim the mileage back at a very high cost. So that is called grey miles because you don't know uh, what was the emissions related to that car and it's a bit like it's grey zone <laughs> in a way. Um, one way that we can support car clubs is if instead of allowing people to use the private cars, you push them to use the available car club vehicles. A big issue with car clubs is that most of the usage is over the weekend or the evenings, but we still have all these fixed costs during the week. And I, myself, I don't want to encourage people to commute with a car club. Like That would be the opposite of what I want to do. I want people to use cars only when they need one. But if you need one for work, and it could be an EV or a low emission hybrid car because car club cars are more modern, then you know, we, that would be a way to support the car clubs during the week. Uh, it helps 
local authorities actually measure their emissions, reduce their emissions. So it's sort of like virtual circle, you know. But again, that is something we're trying to push, but it's not quite getting there just yet. Um, and this is quite basic, but also doesn't happen often. But some marketing support, so uh, having you know, or the name of the car clubs and the link to their website on the council websites really helps in terms of domain authority, brings your SEO up. That means the car clubs end up paying less for <laughs> marketing costs, etc. Um, we've got Baltimore Forest are like top borrow. They've done some vouchers and incentives. They identify people that they think are at risk of buying a second car or there's an opportunity that people could drop that second car or even go car free. So they target these people and then they give them vouchers to try car clubs and they're agnostic. So they open that uh, offer to anyone, all the car clubs in the borough, not just you know one company. And um, yeah, I think one thing that's really, really missing out is in terms of when you have a resident permit, you've got all these reminders, uh, emails, SMS, etc. It's, it's about to be renewed. Do you want to buy another permit? That is like the moment where you could be like, hey, how about you do not <laughs> renew your permit? Sell your car, try something else. We'll give you a voucher. We'll give you some credits, a bit of like a discrepant scheme, but at the point of renewal, and if you did that three months before the renewal, that would be key. And that is not happening, sadly, but <laughs> that would really help. So um, I think that's all I've got. Oh no, one more. <laughs> um, parking policies, I've mentioned it. You know, if councils were charging a fair price, which is no more than 30% resident permit prices, that would cover their sort of overheads to create all these policies. Um, we do think there's a lot of money being wasted in creating car club bays. Uh, everyone has GPS in their cars at the moment. We know where the vehicles are. There's photos at the end, start of bookings. You don't need to have those thick bays, really. Um, so we can go without that. That is a lot of public funding that could just be reallocated towards vouchers, subscriptions, S106, you know, God. <laughs> um, I think restrictions on a new builds, um, not having as much parking would be amazing. We, there's an example in central Bedfordshire where we were given uh, S106 funding to, to put six EVs in. And I went there and <laughs> it was so like uh, disheartening. Basically every of these new builds had enough space for two cars in the front drive. And it's doing terribly. So the cars are barely used. Uh, it's just constant flat batteries after flat batteries because everyone owns a car in those developments. But they've put all these that money into getting those cars there, but they've done nothing to prevent people from owning a car. So there's no need for a car club. So here we are. Um, yeah, and I think uh, there's a big trend in London, which I'm very happy about, is the car-free developments. I've heard about um, borrowers that are super harsh on them, and I'm not mad about it. Uh, if someone puts a new, um, how do you say, like if you want to change the development of your house or add like a, I don't know, a second floor or whatever, in some borrows that turns your house into a car-free house automatically. So any modification to your house is really intense. It's not going well from what I understand, but that would be really great to pair that up with, okay, well, yeah, you'll go car free, but here's a one year subscription to a car club and we'll make sure there's a car actually. So again, not many, um, there's a lot of silos of, uh, in those organizations and uh, not a lot of talking between the two often Car club is seen as a parking issue, and then car free initiatives is like the sustainable or active mode or something well being in the councils, where in fact these two actually go hand in hand and shouldn't be separate. So I think that's it. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no time for questions because I want to get you guys on break. But there is time for each of you uh, to answer the question that I posed.
before the, this presentation. So the what hanging, low the, the low hanging fruit, and it could be, it's more like a magic wand that you said. So if you could, oh. it doesn't have to be you, but if it's government, society, your customers, they would stop being so feeble and. Uh, <laughs> I, I think magic wand for me would be uh, if I could, if I could change the unit economics of the car. So like uh -huh. if a car was just more affordable, for car clubs, but not for residents to <laughs> prevent that problem. Uh, there is a, something in place uh, for the ZEV mandate where uh, OEMs are meant to, if they sell cars or lease cars to car clubs, they get more credits than if they do on private use. A lot of OEMs are not even aware of it. <laughs> so um, I think something like that before all cars, so not just uh, EVs, because we're not there, sadly. I wish we were, but the infrastructure is not there and it takes time and we don't have time. So I'd rather, you know, get the ball rolling with uh, petrol cars, hybrid cars, etc., than change to EVs when it's time. Nice. Please uh, stand up and tell us about your stand up, magic stand up, stand up. one. Yeah. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to say something first because you, you mentioned the Grey Fleet thing. And yeah. one thing that a lot of people don't realise is when people are using their car for those Grey Fleet journeys, they're often not insured. Mm. They're using a, a private car with private insurance for business use. And I think yeah. it's not talked enough about by car clubs. Car clubs should really be pushing uh, this. No, it is. Point out, <laughs> especially with local authorities, yeah. because local authorities are the highest users of grey miles in the country. So, you know, doctor, heal thyself a little bit, local authorities, please. Um, but no, in terms of the magic wand, if I could change one thing, and it's the easiest thing to say, it's the hardest thing to do, is to encourage people to take the most appropriate mode of transport for the journey they're taking. I'm not saying cycle. If I'm going to Glasgow, I'm not going to cycle to Glasgow. Mm. You know, I'm probably going to take a train and then wince about how bloody expensive it is. Uh, but similarly, if I'm in central London like I was today, from Waterloo, the bike was the best option for me. Critically, I'm going to a site visit later today, and I understand why they want a Brockton dock, because there is actually no effective way for me to get there by public transport. I was actually half hoping to leave my bottom behind today. I definitely need it, otherwise I'm not going to make my journey. Car Club is such a vital part of that. And how do we make that magic wand change? It is political will. It's nothing. Mm. Political courage. Unfortunately, there is a very, very noisy minority of people who can make an unbelievable amount of fuss. If we look at Paris with the mayor, she was told, you will never get re-elected by this noisy minority for making Paris so cycle-friendly. And every, the, all the press, right up to the day of the election, was, she's going to be out. She's she going to be out by a landslide. She won by a bigger majority. Mm -hmm. But politicians get so scared, so frightened, especially in the UK, where we have such extreme levels of tribalism around modes of transport. I mean, Paul George has heard me say this a dozen times. We talk about drivers and cyclists. Who talks about tramists and trainists? You know, why have we, we got these tribes called drivers and cyclists? Well, part of it's their sharing infrastructure. Yeah. What if you're both? What are you both? <laughs> I am both. Yeah, exactly. Newsflash, I actually also have a driving licence. Yeah. Um, we've got to detribalise transport. We've got to give politicians the courage to actually make these decisions when they're hearing these buzzing mosquitoes in their ears mm. about low traffic neighbourhoods. People weaponizing 15-minute cities like it's some Orwellian way of controlling where you move. I mean, for people who are coming from the, ne from the Netherlands and from Sweden, literally 15-minute cities has been sold in the UK like an Orwellian thing where you will not be allowed out of your neighbourhood. Can you believe that? But that's it's serious. And you go and speak to people in London boroughs, they actually believe this to be factual. If anyone thinks Trump is the only one who does pro to politics, they just need to come to the UK. We've got to help those politicians because, unfortunately, the data's there proving that modal shift needs to happen, that people need to travel more sustainably. It's all out there. Chris Borden said it at the, at the last active travel thing. The reality is we now need to get it into their hearts, give them the courage to do it. So that's the magic wand. Put some backbone in our politicians. I want to change my wand. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's a good and one. With that, you're on the 10-minute break. Uh, feel free to discuss the remainder two-star items on the board.